Hello, folks. Welcome to Between Awesome and Disaster. This is your host, Will Carey. Uh, thanks for tuning in. I appreciate you being here. Um, this is a, a fun episode uh, we have for you today. Um, when I'm recording this, uh, it's a little bit before Thanksgiving, so you know, uh, always thinking about, uh, I always think about, you know, Maryland around this time of year. And uh, my guest on the show today um, is a playwright, actor, podcaster, writer musician. This guy does it all. Uh, Ira Gammerman. Uh, Ira, when I was a freshman in in uh, college at Towson University doing uh, my uh, degree in theater, uh, Ira had just graduated and he had begun uh, writing plays and he did a stage reading of his first play that he wrote. And uh, my freshman year, uh, that was one, being in his... Uh, the stage reading of his play was one of the first theater things I ever did in college, uh, which my freshman year uh, was very important because you typically aren't eligible. You weren't eligible to get cast in the shows uh, freshman year. Like you, you, your first time to audition was uh, the next uh, semester for like the official like Towson theater uh, productions. I went to, to Towson University uh, outside of Baltimore, Maryland for, for school. And this uh, this play I did with uh, Ira was one of the first kind of like little things when I was like very, still very young, very eager and excited to uh, to just do things. Like, and, and it was really, it was a big deal for me at the time. And Ira has, uh, and, and you'll hear me tell him this in the podcast, Ira was doing all the things then that I wanted to be doing as a freshman, um, but was uh, thinking very far ahead and but uh, w- kind of had to focus on uh, my immediate schoolwork and then adjusting to life outside of home. Uh, but Ira was playing in a band at the time. Uh, he was writing plays. He was making, uh, he was known in the local art scene in Baltimore. And we talk about that a little bit. And uh, it was really cool to get to sit down and chat with a, uh, uh, again, uh, a buddy of mine who I've not seen in a very long time, and someone who, uh, someone who's, uh, you know, in this narrative of my of my career in show business that I'm attempting to carve out here, um, he's a, a player in that. So w- it was really cool to get to sit down and talk to him. Um, thank you guys again, uh, all of you, uh, so much for the kind words on the uh, the anti flag interview. I'm still writing a, a very giddy high uh, from getting to interview Justin and and Chris number two from Anti-Flag. If you enjoyed the show and you think you know a friend who might want to hear it as well, uh, they can uh, find the show anywhere you get your podcasts. I'm on Twitter at ComicWillCarry. You can follow me there. And uh, I hope you're having a, if you're listening to Surround Thanksgiving, I hope things are going well. I hope food tastes good. Hope the, the arguments with family are manageable. Uh, and if they aren't, then I hope you, uh, get to leave soon. And, uh, my Thanksgiving will be interesting because my mom's coming to visit for the first time. Uh, well, I think by the time you listen to this, she already will have come, but, uh, I'll let you know in the future how it went. This is the first time she's come to visit me in New York. And I think on the almost, uh, 10 years I've, I've lived here. She came for a day once, but this is her first time coming for an extended amount of time in New York City. And I'm really excited that she's coming. So uh, hopefully it went well. And uh, I will, I'll, I'll touch base with you guys after the interview. But let's, uh, right now, let's go to my chat with uh, my buddy, Ira Gammerman. <laughs> Two thousand twelve, it may have been. Well, that's what 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 I think it was because I used to I used to have a job selling uh, tickets for off Broadway theater shows for a theater company, and I was going to do box office for this Mulan drum musical, and I think I saw you on the subway when I was going from Times oh. Square down to the East Village. Okay, that's what that's what I seem to recall. My other memory of you, Ira Gammerman, is uh, when I was a freshman at Towson University. Oh my god. Uh, doing my doing my theater uh degree i think you were there for grad school right 
Uh, no, I mean, I just graduated, but I was just like, you know, hanging, still in Baltimore and just kind of hanging around. <laughs> oh, okay. Gotcha. As the Matthew McConaughey of uh, I, I Towson would, University, you know? Yeah. I was that for a couple of years before <laughs> I left for, for New York also. So I also remember like my, cause you know, like s- the first semester would be very rare for anyone to get cast in it and, or do anything. All so, right. so I think he, maybe it was like your first play or one of your oh, first God, plays. Yeah, I do remember. We this. were doing oh a stage uh, yeah. and I got cast in the stage reading of your, of your play, which oh, yeah. I was really excited about. That's awesome. That's that play. Oh my God. I think I've buried that now. Cause I'm just like, no one should see this. <laughs> it's one of those things you write at the time and you're just like, yeah, so just, now that I have perspective as a, an adult artist, I can be like, I, I can see where I need to get that out. And, you know, right. now it's just, I'm going to lock it in a box. And just be completely done with it. Pretty much. Yeah. Basically. Yeah. <laughs> That's how I feel about uh, some of my early, uh, my early band projects. Like, my, Oh yeah. Like uh, my band uh, in, in col in college. Like I think of some of the lyrics I wrote and I was like, Oh bro, yeah. dude, what, what, what are, what are we even doing here? <laughs> it's like, you know, just like com- w- completely devoid of any kind of perspective. Like everything is just the worst thing. Yeah, the early aughts were like a really much more innocent time in a lot of ways. I know. <laughs> I also feel like every generation says something similar to that. Like, yeah. oh, oh, when I was younger, things were so much s- simpler. And then, and then you just keep going back. It's like, oh, well, you know, you also had the Vietnam War, and then you had the Cold War, and then you had the possible threat of nuclear annihilation. Right. Yeah. Then you had World War II, and then you had the Great Depression, yeah, <laughs> and then yeah. you had. Uh, the stock market crash and then the Titanic sank. And I was like, I, I, I keep wondering when was there has to have been somewhere a perfect time, right? I, I'm not sure. I really, I couldn't tell you. I don't know. I'm sure we've all got something. I, I, I imagine so. Um, so I would, I would say you're also, I say this uh, a few times. You're in that category of people who I feel like I know very well. Oh, good. But uh, I, I don't know too much about your life. Oh, that's cool. But I know you through like your work. Cause, yeah. Because when, and again, just to go back to my freshman year of college again, <laughs> uh, when I was just, when I was, when, when I was just in that group of like just fresh, uh, of like just fresh out of high school with yeah. theater kids, like with this is the dream, right? And they're just trying to, beat it out of you to see who's going to stay in yep. after the after uh, who's still going to be there for spring yep when you when i when i first met you and i started doing your your reading for that play that was like one of those like oh okay i was trying to be you i think oh, for, good. for oh, a certain nice. while all right i'll take that that's cool and then your band was very cool like you were doing oh, all the things you were doing all the things i wanted to be doing good that's right i'm glad to hear that that's really nice time. so so yeah absolutely absolutely man and you're you're still like continuing to do all of those things i feel I'm like still a lot at of it, it. <laughs> which i love that everyone from that crew mostly is still continuing to do uh do creative things yeah. like uh like i had to like i realized you have a wikipedia page i do i you know it was one of those stupid i wish i didn't actually i started it myself because i thought it would make me seem more legitimate but now it was one of those things where i had enough like Baltimore press uh-huh. where I seemed like they couldn't take me off even though they knew that I wrote it myself. Sure. And it was one of those weird conundrum situations where it was like, he clearly wrote this himself for his own self-promotional purposes. But mm-hmm. at the same time, there's enough like actual press being like, this guy's legitimate that like we can't take it down. So it sure. exists in this weird nether region. And now it's like, it's full of plays that I just don't even, I don't even know. I just think it, I, people think it's neat that I have a Wikipedia. It's, I don't know. I think it's overrated. Well, I, <laughs> well, when I was like, oh, I was like, and then I was like reading some of this stuff on there. Like, I didn't know you're Austra- part Australian. I'm not. See, that's the, this oh, is that the bullshit. thing. That's sort of, wi- <laughs> uh, it's somewhat willful disinformation, uh, which I think is neat. But uh, in this, this Trumpian area, uh, it's partly um, so Siobhan, our mutual friend, Siobhan O'Loughlin, uh, we, yes. s- we started a theater company with two Australian friends of ours. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was like two Australians and two Americans. And so we came up with this word, Australia American, mm-hmm. to like, dis- you know, it's like a, just a fun way to describe things. And um, it, as a result of it not being a real word, uh-huh. autocorrect immediately thought it was like Australian. And then, you know, after a while, it's like if if a spell check doesn't recognize something as an actual real word instead of something that you've just kind of sure. like creatively imagined, it just goes back to like the, the closest 
corollary. So, sure, and sure. then it just was up there. And then suddenly my Wikipedia page is like part Australian. And I'm just like, okay, I mean, I'll, I'm not going to change it. You know, it's, but well, it's part of building like your mythos. Yeah. That's the mythos. Like, yeah. That's like the whole, like, Oh, uh, Jack, Jack and Meg white are, are they, are they brother and sister? Yeah. Are they, div- are they married? Were they married? What's going on there? It's just like all the, the, keeping being fresh in in people's minds because yeah and then i especially feel like i feel and i don't know what your experience of, of baltimore of baltimore was i lived there for 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 six years i f- i feel like it's uh the art scene there is is different now like it's considered yeah. a stop uh especially for uh like the diy community oh especially. for sure definitely um but i i i, I remember i remember enjoying it there and wanting to be uh, involved in things, but thinking that I, I eventually needed to, to move because like I would see like, like the established groups and I could never get in with like every man. I could never get in. Like when do they even have auditions? Right. I could never like crack the nut of becoming an actor in the Baltimore theater community. So it's just like, I eventually found stand up and then got to New York. Well, I was curious because I think you had, were a lot more active uh, outside of, the edu- educational circles than I was. Yeah, in yeah. So I was, I was curious if you could tell me what some of your experiences were. Actually, actually like probably very similar to yours. Uh, I, I also was like, how do you get cast in Center Stage or Every Man or any of these places? And at some point, like I had this play Split. Uh, I don't know if you recall. Like it was kind of like a big, a Baltimore big deal. Yeah, you I, re- know? I remember reading about it. It was, it was fun. It was like neat, and it um. But then, you know, you're 24 and like you don't have a second play and you don't really have the life experience to quite create one yet. Um, So like at some point I like took a like a literary meeting with like the literary director of um, Center Stage and was like, hey, I'm this playwright. We've met a couple of times. How do I get my play produced at Center Stage? And he's like and his response was something like, um yeah go to new york and maybe get produced there and like maybe in 10 years like we'll we'll think about it and like that was that was kind of the response and after a while like you hear that enough times from Uh of course now it's like 10 years later sure i pro i almost have the play that i think would be good for them but of course that literary manager is like long gone gone now yeah um so it's it's that that was funny and then you know like the music scene was, oh my God, incredible. Like those Wham City shows at the copycat building circa mm-hmm. 2006, 2007 with like Dan Deacon and the death set and like all this, there's all this stuff that I was like, never, it's like sometimes you'd walk into these shows, they'd be completely like somebody's warehouse apartment where there's like, you know, eight art school kids. They're uh-huh. all probably paying like $50. The place looks like, a, like like a fire hazard like a, f- a complete fire hazard they've got like dan deacon set up in one corner ponytail set up in the other corner the death set in the other corner like they start they finish there's no break in the action to stop for 20 minutes to have the next band set up it's immediately like the death set's done dan deacon starting and it's just like it it the the, the, the they were all illegal it was all this <laughs> thing that like you just had to know where to go. Sure. It, I don't even really understand how I fell into some of the stuff, but like that was just, that was some of the most inspiring stuff uh-huh. I'd I, ever seen. Oh, awesome. I must've completely missed that part of Baltimore's music. Yeah. Scene. Cause the, the music scene I was in, involved in was like, uh, auto bar. Um, oh, yeah. maybe that I don't, I don't even think that eight by 10 was on our radar. Um, but like, I remember the big deal was when my, my band played, when we played like, uh, an early show at the record theater. Oh yeah. That was like big time. I felt, yeah. we felt like rock stars. Yeah. Oh yeah. That was, that was, uh, incredible. It's a, like a nightclub now, which it's, makes me sad. It doesn't even exist. I saw so many good shows there, but it doesn't, it doesn't exist anymore. No, my, my actual band was never cool enough for my, my actual band was like, somewhere in the middle of those scenes where like we weren't art school enough for the art school scene, but we weren't like poppy or whatever. We didn't do pop. And by that, I mean, we couldn't draw 50 people on a fucking on, Tuesday of course, to the yeah. record theater. And yeah. they had that, like, if you can't draw 60 people on a fucking Monday, 
don't even bother showing your face in this town again. You know, like it's that kind of shit. And like, we were just like, neither of those things. Um, yeah, because I remember your band. I have I would listen to your songs on MySpace. I remember that. Oh, like, nice. words, words, words. I remember that. Oh, so, yeah. Oh, that's that good. People like that one. People yeah. like that one. Yeah, because I, I, I think I, I hear what you're saying because, like, your, your stuff was very good, but it was not that kind of weird experimental, like, not at all. defy all expectations. Like, yeah. I remember finding this MySpace for a group called Needle Gun okay. in Baltimore on MySpace, and it was like, pure just pure noise yeah like yeah. just banging ah oh yeah and then that's somehow a commentary on like the world at large or something so it's like oh genius city yeah paper <laughs> well that's yeah i mean the city the city paper folks were really they were way more into the, the sort of art schooly subversive stuff way less the like i think they reviewed my band and called us like some kind of a combination of like ted leo and hoobastank and it was like always they would they would always like they'd always hit you with the praise and then like undercut you somehow. You know what I mean? It was always yeah. like I'd like I I'd won like a best playwright of Baltimore award in like two thousand six or whatever, and like it was like, you know, Gamberman's play is amazing. He probably won't be able to keep it up for long, but like <laughs> it's just like there was all, they, oh. it was always like we'll build you up, but we'll like yeah. sucker punch you back down to it's earth. Like also. That, but the, but it's city papers, so it's that like aspiring like Williamsburg kind of snark oh yeah praise. definitely like, yeah so it's and and also to compare you to Hoobastank oh you mean that band that has a massively popular song sure. that lots of people like they were not it was not a compliment <laughs> oh I, I did not take it as such either <laughs> oh I I always fall on the like whenever I get into music like music debates with people that's like I try not to get into it too deep on online but I did once. Uh, recently get it good into if a random person about the offspring is like do people think the offspring are bad he's like oh the, the off the offspring got were successful but they were never good good it's like okay right we're we're not arguing from the same place sure now. sure um so so was was it music for you early on or what or was uh because i I again always see you as this sort of like modern day renaissance sort of oh, man. Thanks. Do yeah. Like creative in many different ways, which I think is very cool. Yeah. So like when you were growing up, was 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 being a playwright a conscious thought that you had you developed, or did that come much later? Okay, it, it all came later. Uh, I mean, I started as a as an actor. Uh, um, you know, doing all those shows in high school because you know you're enough mm-hmm. of a weirdo that you need some kind of a an outlet, and sure, you don't fit in on those sports teams or whatever the stuff is. And then theater's like this, like, oh yeah, that's great. Um, and then yeah, just continued on with that through college, and then I. Towards the end of college, I think, um, remember that, that class acting three, I don't know if you, that was still on the books when you were, I think so, but because, uh, I didn't get into the acting track and went general studies, I, oh, didn't, yeah. I didn't get to acting three. I oh, think, it, I think acting two is as hard as I could yeah. go. Um, but yes, it I was, do. it was interesting. It was like the only six credit class on the, on the books in Towson university. And it was basically like a self-generated solo performance class mm-hmm. where you had to, you know, like write these odd monologues for yourself and it all kind of ended with like a 15 minute solo show and i think around this time i started to feel a lot more comfortable with the idea of writing stuff Mm -hmm. and feeling i don't want to say stage fright necessarily but just like a different kind of like overthinking anxiety when i would get on stage sure because well I, and I thought about this too when I started doing stand up. It's so interesting that that's the the final scene because like I've done an hour a solo performance uh, of my own show. Oh so yeah, it's, so it's crazy to think how far we've come in an odd. Oh my god, the, so far, classes. Jesus. Oh my god. Um, I but the anxiety for me was very different because I feel like uh, when you're doing a play. It's still challenging, but it's challenging in a different way. Yeah, like the words are there. You, and the, you don't have to generate the words and the emotion behind them and figure out what it means. Yeah, yeah. Compared to when you're creating everything and it's all coming from your imagination. Right. And then you have like I, collaborators or, or I guess professors or directors asking you questions. And you're just, I, I've had plenty of times where I've just like, I mean, yeah, I mean this. Right. I, yeah, I, I don't know. I, so I, um, 
I felt really, I just felt weird um, and felt like I had more to say than just how people perceive me. And, you know, and people would just cast me as like the funny guy, you know, sure. like, you know, like the, do, the, do, the doofus, you know what I sure, mean? And yeah. it's like after a while of that, you're just like, yeah, cool. I mean, I am somewhat doofusy, but it's not all I have to offer. Mm-hmm. And um, I was I was doing the like the kind of more community theater scene in Baltimore a little bit after yeah. I graduated and it's like working a day job and doing the stuff. And like mm-hmm. I just got you you could feel the glass ceiling like although I guess maybe I shouldn't. Someone told me that a glass ceiling is specifically a, a thing that women it's specifically gendered for women. But I, th- I think glass ceilings are I mean, universally makes, non-gendered. I don't know. I, I hadn't heard that. I could see why someone would say that. But uh, I, I agree with you in that I think there's, uh, unless you're all time low, there's a certain level you're going to yeah, hit. Yeah, totally. Um, performing in Baltimore specifically, you're, yeah. you got to you gotta get on the road. No, and if it's not completely. A, and if you're not doing a kind of show, I feel, I feel like, like Siobhan actually I think is, uh, and I've been trying to get her on this show oh, for, a, for a while, she's, but she's, she's busy. busy. She's more famous than all of us now. Like. <laughs> uh, it's It's true because I feel like, um, when you think of like, you know, hardcore DIY kind of touring, yeah. that's something that, you know, feels very familiar to bands. Yeah. Feels very familiar to like comedians, even improv, uh, and, and sketch, I think, uh, theater performers that I don't think that model really exists. Yeah. And I think, sh- and I'm sure there are other examples, but I think she's my example of that for like theater. Oh yeah. Da- yeah. She's tapped into something really yeah. unique and specific, but, uh, but yeah, so I, I got really pissed about yeah just not really being a professional i guess involved not even being able to be a professional in baltimore right and i was just kind of like i basically like retired from acting at the age of like 23 or 24 or something Mm -hmm. and uh basically like wrote that play that that we read in Uh uh your freshman year and then started this band and really kind of haven't looked back um and really and in in the past couple of years like i've come back around to acting either just performing my own stuff or just because friends asked me to do things and Mm -hmm. i i mean i think i realize now that a lot of my anxiety was like my only skill to offer is pretending to be somebody else Mm -hmm. and this is all i can do and it's entirely dependent on how people perceive me and people rarely perceive me the right way and it's like this, it was a real head fuck. But now, now I'm in this weird place where like, as of, I don't know, like two, three weeks ago, I said, people are like, have you ever considered acting? Because. And you're like, funny, you should mention and that. I'm like, and I'm like, I'm now, it's like this thing where I'm like, it's just one of the zillions of temp jobs that I do. Cause I'm just like, you know, it's just like you show up to a set, you're there, they feed you, you don't really do anything. You can't, mm-hmm. you're not high enough where you can fuck anything up super majorly but sure. you're just kind of background and i don't know anyway it's it's weird it's weird that it's all come full circle to be honest with you yeah i never say i'm retired from anything i'm just uh i'm just waiting for the the next the next thing yeah and i'm at a point where uh there are certain indignities i will not uh put myself through i, d- I don't blame you just because it's not worth it like uh uh you know bringer shows what don't care yeah or, or that kind of stuff or like uh odd scammy acting job where you want oh, me man. to help where you're trying to get people to produce and, and your your film also yeah like uh, some of some of the calls i would read on backstage i would just be like wow really dude yeah yeah <laughs> it's weird stuff it's weird stuff yeah. um i just got there's so many of those situations that i just <laughs> mm-hmm. i think i just got one today that was like a like an email from somebody in like broken english being like you compose film music for me i send you documentation you send resume like you know like and you're just like okay like uh-huh sounds great like, yeah I got, I once got, uh, I, I remember like my first year out of Towson, I was like, uh, I had booked like a kid's play in Virginia and, and randoms and stuff. And I got this email about an audition that was like in all random, all caps. And I was just, <laughs> like, like, it was the other, the only one of the very few times I've ever been like, that feels dangerous. Yeah. I'm not yeah going to be involved in yeah. that. Yeah. 
It's got to be so much worse for women, though. I can't oh, 100%. Even, I can't even imagine the number of calls that are just like, must be comfortable jerking someone off with your top off. You know what I mean? Like, it's it's just got to be yeah. so and weird. You're just, and you're just like, is this porn? It's like, no, I'm I'm very inspired by Andy Warhol film. Uh, yes, absolutely. Andy Wa- Warhol sexual film. I make erotica. Erotic it's art. Uh, the sexuality. Anyway, yeah. It is very empowering, you say. <laughs> <laughs> pretty much yeah. pretty much um and and where did you and where did you grow up you're not from maryland originally i am i am from maryland uh i grew up oh, i, did, I yeah. thought you're from the midwest for some reason no i i've spent time in the midwest um <laughs> but uh no i'm from i'm from baltimore originally uh, I, uh the the baltimore county pikes pikesville oh i know heard of it? i know uh, pikesville I, I i dated a girl from pikesville the, oh, really? uh, and my fiance's uh family is is also uh originally from that area like oh, super really? the super hasidic area oh that's funny yeah. um yeah it is it is the jewiest suburb in all mm-hmm. of in all of maryland it was one of those weird things where like it took me going to towson to realize that like the rest of the world wasn't disproportionately jewish you know what i mean like sure. it definitely it took me a minute because it's like its own it's its own little israel yeah there, it's you know? its own kind of connected thing and it took me getting to towson to meet anyone who was jewish because oh I'm, really I'm, I'm from calvert county it's a very oh yeah not not a super diverse place. i don't uh, yeah it's that place gosh geez they are all the, oh, so the you other know it. So I, I'm, I used to go see the uh the fireworks there over um oh on July. on uh on the patuxent river oh yeah oh yeah the fireworks are really great down there that was the only extent that was the only occasion i think i had to go to calvert county but Mm-hmm. Well, I, I don't go very often. Now. Yeah, I, I go to see my mom a couple times. Yeah, that's fair enough. Dad, I'm sure they're just like liberals in New York. You know, like I, I, <laughs> I imagine so. I, def- <laughs> I definitely am particular with who I tell in Calvert that I live in New York. Fair enough. Yeah. Um. Okay. And so, so you're from Pikesville. So you're growing up in, uh, so, and you're you're growing up in Pikesville, super Jew- Jewish area. And were you raised uh super religious? Um. I mean, I want to say super real. I wasn't Hasidic by any stretch of the imagination. I mm-hmm. think the official title is like modern conservative Judaism. Mm-hmm. Um, I got bar mitzvah and yeah. you know went to Hebrew school and you know did the did the thing. Um, although I just never, I didn't really quite fit in with that whole scenario. Sure, but in some weird way, I think like the Jewish identity of kind of having like an outsider's perspective on mainstream culture Mm -hmm. has remained for me but it also like i had that outsider's perspective in a community full of jews who were supposed to be just like me but i felt very alienated from um so you're like a double outsider kind of yeah a little bit i i'm looking now at like some friends who you know did the Jewish youth groups and had a good time and mm-hmm. have all their friends, you know, they did the, did the birthright stuff and they, they're still active with their synagogues and they have all these connections now. And I'm like, Oh, that would have been, that would have been nice. But, uh, mm-hmm. you know, I, it's, you don't realize that that's what it is when you're young, I guess you're just kind of like, yeah, like, yeah, like, uh, it, I definitely like the, the idea of community. That's something I came to, late uh later but my community i i eventually found in in punk rock and in stand up yeah for sure where i can have just like the most like messed up conversations with yeah. comedians and no one's like that that's an eye or you know I ha- i'm hanging out with like older people younger people drug addicts sober people yeah. it's just a real that was my like melting pot kind of experience yeah. as far as like meeting people that are like oh your life is very different from mine yeah that makes sense that uh-huh. makes sense and what did uh, what was your home life like when you were younger? What did your folks do? Uh, my dad is a mechanical engineer. Um, he like I think at the time he was like building submarines, and at some point he um, he developed the satellite technology so that uh, television stations can broadcast in high definition, which is oh really kind of fucking crazy like uh that's wild um he's a really like quiet mild-mannered dude and Uh i like my my mom is like not technically inclined at all she's like Mm -hmm. you know she's like a teacher and like very sociable my Um, mom was a teacher also oh no what'd she teach uh she taught fourth grade fifth and fourth grade for most of the time i was alive when she was uh before I was born, she taught a uh, second and third also. So, oh, but yeah. but all like elementary education. My mom was like preschool mostly at the synagogue as well. Uh-huh. Like, it was like very uh, that, and um, she. I mean, um, yeah, it was a weird. I mean, they're 
their personalities. They're real personalities. Like my mom's very uh-huh. sociable and neurotic, and my dad's very like quiet and but he can like build a fucking submarine. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like it's just weird. They they they're they're cool folks. But uh-huh. awesome. And what and uh, did you play guitar early on also, or did that come? Later? I uh, yeah. There was a um. I learned it probably like late middle school, early high school. There was there was just like a high school class where you could basically just go learn chords and yeah i had a i had a there was a similar class at in my high school like i think we were learning like sheet music so it was like dun 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 like really oh, yeah. basic like first position stuff but uh um yeah eventually i think someone taught me like a, oh you you could take this shape and then you could just move it around a bunch yeah, and, yeah. and then you have a song yeah, it was literally like they'd start you with like Horse With No Name by America because it was only like two chords. Uh huh. And then you'd like gradually like move up from like Zombie by the Cranberries all the way up to like Smells Like Teen Spirit. You know what I sure, mean? Like it was sure. like a real, yeah. it was very 90s. But it was, I mean, it was like a super helpful way to learn the instrument. And I mean, I know next to nothing about music theory, but, mm-hmm. um, you know, I know enough to like operate yeah. and move uh-huh. forward which is all i really particularly care about yeah like i know i know enough to just to, i i i consider myself more a songwriter and i and i view the guitars and basses as as tools yeah yeah whereas if i had to call someone if i was going to call someone a guitar player i would think of like you know like a marty freeman or somebody oh, sure or a uh, john pertucci some yeah, like yeah. somebody who has like a more like a, a command and knowledge of like of like I'm going to do this and then I'm going to do this. And it's so ingrained in me. I don't even have to think about right, it. Right. Yeah. About it. Yeah. That to me is what like guitar playing is versus like songwriting. But I, I do see them as two. I see them as two branches of the same kind of skill. Yeah. I mean, that makes sense. there's like the theory side of things, but then there's also like the physical, like you touching your instrument and practicing on a regular basis thing. And sometimes they can be like a compliment to each other, but they're, functionally like i think slightly different mm-hmm. skills in a lot of ways yeah um yeah are and you are you're writing new music now yes i'm in a i'm in a playing bass in a band right now actually oh, that's cool so um i'm very excited about it because i hadn't played in a band since baltimore yeah honestly. yeah yeah so i'm excited to be doing that again that's awesome and and i know you do music stuff too you do i uh, do you're uh like cool alt folk uh yeah, yeah. mandolin stuff Honda mandolin. yeah that came about um so uh one of the one of the bizarre things about how i grew up um i uh i was estranged from my paternal grandmother for like a number of years Mm -hmm. and i didn't meet her for the first time until like 2014 um Mm -hmm. and um so when i first met her she had this electric mandolin that it belonged to my grandfather who i never had the opportunity to really like Mm -hmm. know and um had this like immediate moment of like cool this is what i'm doing now Uh and uh it was really i mean you know like people i'd actually had somebody had like an old bandmate was like i have the shitty mandolin do you want to try it and i was like what is this thing it's fucking crazy but um at some point you know when you meet your strange grandmother for the first time sure and she's got this mandolin that's like it felt like you're like my grandfather was like literally like reaching out from beyond the grave to be like, Uh we never had the opportunity to do this in real life, but we can commune in this like super supernatural way Uh um, from beyond the grave. And it was really, it was neat actually. Cause I, you know, I, my parents have, abysmal music taste. I mean, like Uh it's, it's offensive how bad it is. Like they, um, they're into music that I, the only, way that i could even describe it as like elevator music like it's just okay. like absolute so like smooth jazz like smooth jazz like they're they're like my mom at some point was like i love jazz and i was like oh yeah do you uh, what about miles davis bitches brew and like i p- played them bitches brew and she was like this is a jazz and i'm just like i don't think you're into jazz mom like <laughs> no. you know but right, right. Uh, so i so i spent a lot of time in my you know a adulthood and you know early adolescence just being like music really affects me in a super personal way and i no one else in my family seems to be on this wavelength like where did this come from sure no that makes sense because my uh my dad is not like a 
he's kind of a like your a classic hardworking American guy. Like oh, he's yeah. not a and you you know he he's very into cars, but and but he's not like creative in that way that that I would think I am. And, yeah, yeah. And my mom, uh, I think she paints, but she never really talked to me about her painting. <laughs> sure, sure. So I was just kind of growing up this like, oh, I like to sit in my room and 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 make noises on things. Yeah. And I was like. Yeah, and I knew so few people that shared those kinds of interests until I got until I got out of Calvert. Yeah, yeah, it's fair enough. So you're so you're playing good. Gu- so you're playing guitar. So you're in middle school. You're playing guitar. Um, and you went to high school in in uh, Baltimore. In, uh, also, yeah. Pikesville High. Pikesville High, class okay. of two thousand. So when you get to high school, this is something I always like to 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 think about. Um, I don't. It took me a year to become like the theater a theater kid at high school, but oh, was yeah. that early? Did that happen early on for you? Who, what uh, Breakfast Club uh, type do you fall into? Oh boy, um, uh, none of them. Uh, the breakfast, it's been a while since I've seen the Breakfast Club. Not Emilio Estevez, and then not um, the bully. Uh, I guess probably the nerd, if that's mm-hmm. the case. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think. I high school wise like I I took theater classes like when I was a freshman and it was actually like really interesting because you know you'd have to do some kind of ridiculous activity like when you go around in a circle and saying your name like do a body movement that we'll all repeat and like the number of people who I like perceived (laughs) as like the fitting in popular kids who had a lot more status than I did like just couldn't do this they were too self-conscious to do this like very basic thing that was like sure it was uncomfortable but like literally like we're all doing it so Mm -hmm. you know it's like there should be some kind of a safe spacey vibe where you don't feel these level of discomfort and then like my awareness of that early on was like oh this is like a covert I mm-hmm. could I could sneak in under the radar here somewhere and sure. you know fuck around with some stuff, um, and you know there was like the hierarchies in high school like you know it takes a year or two before you get cast in like a really good part or something but sure I think by like my sophomore year I was I was like doing it every year and mm-hmm. yeah um, that sounds that was about about right for me I was also really good at whenever they needed some but something that required being tall or strong yeah i guess that's that's how <laughs> uh, my my high school did crazy for you because i don't uh, know i don't know what your school is like but we would do like a a comedy uh like a straight play a comedy in the fall and then we do a musical in the spring yeah yeah and uh i couldn't i can't sing like the pretty musical theater people no, I can don't, i don't have that ability um but i when my school did crazy for you and they needed someone who could pick up an upright bass and play it like a guitar. Yeah. Aces. I bet. I'm your I guy. Bet. Um, so, so you, so you were pretty much like, at, like acting like early on, like, yeah, I guess from the time that school. I was like 16, mm-hmm. 15, something like that. And then is that during that time, is that when you go, maybe I'll continue pursuing this? Oh yeah, definitely. I was like, I was like voted like, most unique and most talented in the the yearbook superlatives and uh-huh yeah i'd like carved out a little niche for myself when mm-hmm. you know there was no other niche to carve out yeah. really so um yeah it just made sense people really responded to it and you know I, I, it's really powerful when you have a lot of people telling you like you're good at something oh yeah um it really it has a really enduring effect and you hear it enough times that you, you think like, I don't know, it's not just my mom telling me this, you know, like there's the mm-hmm. outside people are telling me that I'm talented and they seem to be doing it a lot. So I guess I should, I guess I should keep moving with this. Uh-huh. Like, um, t- yeah, it just made sense. Yeah. So, so that, so that, that kind of like, okay, the, the plan gets, uh, gets set there. Yeah. And so, so then. So then Towson, I imagine we probably had some of the same professors. I, would, I Yeah, I imagine so. I don't I think anybody so. else. Because when you did the, like, say your name and do a body movement, I definitely remember doing that in a, in a Tommy Casero movement oh, class. Oh, yeah. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure. It, it was, it's a staple in a lot of theater classes, to be fair. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's, yeah. A, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a pretty solid, re- reliable one. Yeah, it's a good icebreaker. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm trying, to, trying to think, because I feel like, I feel like my, edu- I feel like my, uh, acting education at at that school was fairly well rounded. I feel like I learned a lot. I do feel like I learned a different a lot of different things. I don't know if I was necessarily prepared for the 
business side yeah. of sh- of show business. Totally. Um, and I also felt like, okay, maybe in a few years I'll be in, even, it's going to take me a few years of living to just even get to a point where I could be a bit right for certain roles. Yeah. Cause you don't have the, like, you don't have the, the memories to pull like your sense memory and yeah, all your Uta sure. Hagen, uh, your Uta Hagen and uh, your method acting stuff yeah. until you've been tossed around in the tumble dryer of life a little bit. hundred percent. It's, it's good that you had that knowledge when you were that young. Cause I don't think, I think I have that knowledge now. And I think that's the only reason that anybody's like halfway interested in casting me in anything because I'm not a child anymore. Um, yeah. But at the time I was just like, why don't people cast me? I'm so good. You know, yeah. like it's that, it's that level of, I don't know. It's, yeah. it's, it's weird. Well, the, too much anxiety. The, the other, another quote that I think about when it, when it comes to like alleviating that, like, Oh, am I, I terrible? Am I terrible? Yeah. Is that, uh, is that Philip Seymour Hoffman, uh, there was something I saw him, uh, after he died, they did a moment of Zen on the daily show where, oh. uh, uh, he talked about viewing auditions as a way to, as a time to practice your craft. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that, and that, and thinking about it like that. And then with the like, Oh, if I get a job, great. Yeah. Yeah. That seems like a healthier way of, a uh, of approaching. Oh my it. God. The only reason I think anything is happening for me right now is because I don't care at all. I've put zero effort into the whatsoever. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. I'm literally just like, people are just like, Oh, you want to do a thing? I'm like, it's, it's, that's fine. Cool. Like that's the extent I think, I think the more fixated you get on like, I've got to get the role. I need to do anything that I'll fillet anybody who they need me to fillet. And I'll make, you know, like you start to get into this weird state of desperation. And like, I think people can like sense it on you. Yeah. Like it's, it's strange, but like, so I've, my, my mantra has just been like, just care less about it. It's like, it seems weird to think that but it I, in some back ass way it kind of works i don't i don't know why it works that way well i i yeah i don't really either and i kind of do a similar thing i think about all the stuff i could do i i, I could do that is out of my control like getting cast in something in somebody else's project is out of my control totally uh creating my own things and then putting myself in them that is very much in my control yeah so, so writing songs in this room or podcasting in, in this in this room, uh, writing something in in this room, that's all stuff I can control. So that's a level of that's like a, a, a sigh of, of relief. Yeah. When, compared to like, OK, you're going out on like commercial auditions or uh, I'm making voice reel uh, auditions. And oh, it's yeah. Like, well, uh, uh, I got no I have no say in what happens here. It's just no, totally. a, a total crapshoot. Yeah. You just have to show up and be willing to record the audition or be willing to Mm -hmm. be willing to meet the people or whatever it is. And that, and that's, and that a lot of that is literally just like, they think you're the right person or they don't think you're the right person. And that is so far out of your control in some ways that to just, you've just got to be yourself. Yeah. And then also having that vibe of, uh, I, I'm competent and I'm easy to work with. Oh my I, God. Yeah. That's, that's number one thing. And I feel like I've heard that enough that, but I, I like talking about it anyways, is that, uh, I will work. W- I would rather work with people that maybe are, l- are less skillful, but are nice and a de- and a good hang. Oh, a hundred percent. Than talented people who are going to make me want to shoot myself in the head. No, I get it. I totally get it. Yeah. I mean so much of just like showing up on time. Yeah, you'd think that you would know, be pretty easy. You'd think it's like the simplest thing to do. Like, but it's really for some people it's like hyper difficult. Just being like, if they ask for a headshot, bring a headshot. You know what I mean? It's yeah. like simple professional mm-hmm. things that like some people just can't they're like too much of an artist or they're too discombobulated to really Yeah. Do. It's yeah, it's I, weird. I, I I do think Tessin should have a uh, like a, a a at least one business class. Oh, it'd be bu- helpful. Yeah, one business side of of this, or or even just have like, I guess people like you and me and Sh- Siobhan come back and be like, "Here's what it's yeah. This is what the actual world this is, is what it's like. gonna be like when you're out there now. Yeah, now you kids are hip with the the influencing and the social media, oh so you probably God. already know. But I'm just gonna say yeah. it again to let you know you're right. I've actually talked to uh, some old professors from my grad school who uh, are dealing with 
these students now who just like require trigger warnings for everything mm-hmm. and they're like literally like they were like talking like my my teacher was like talking about like being in a scene study class mm-hmm. and like breaking down a scene and being like um you know there's uh this is the moment where you trigger a reaction and the whole room is like oh <gasps> you can't say trigger it's triggering <laughs> and you're just like and she has to just be like this is too like whatever you're railing against like this is too far like honestly like there has to be some kind of room for you to feel discomfort otherwise like i know this is something i i i, I talk about a lot in in the comedy world because there are sex there are scenes in in stand-up comedy that are are fuck you and your feelings i'm going to say the oh yeah the most offensive thing possible possible and then there's the like uh the like uh super uh progressive uh woke crowd mm-hmm. that's gonna rail against the system and all and all this other and stand up for and 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 i just i don't fit really well into either of those yeah yeah because i i find because i find annoyances with both sides um but that's like um it, aligning yourself with those ideologies is like a business decision now oh completely very and much I'm just so not, and 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 I'm not willing to do. That. I'm no, not I don't. To, I don't blame you um, to do that. So I'm just gonna. I'm. I'm on the long path track to. I'm. I'm on the Mark Maron model. Basically, it's probably. I. I honestly, I probably am also. To be honest with you, uh, yeah, completely. It's not. I don't. I mean, like being woke is cool, but I. It's not an ethos. You know what I mean? There's not a. There's not an woke manifesto that's been like vetted and agreed upon you know it's literally right. just like yeah also uh, also i i i could i could so see like i feel i feel like there uh, i could just i would if i try if i was a teacher i'd get fired so fast I'd be oh like, yeah oh you can't you can't say triggered because it's triggering I'm, I'm gonna be like life is gonna kick your ass i know completely <laughs> you will fail at everything if you don't grow a pair <laughs> yeah like pretty much like basically it's uh it's uh the children of today. I used to I used to work <laughs> at a summer camp recently teaching music to kids mm-hmm. and they would all like they'd wear like David Bowie shirts mm-hmm. and I'd be like David Bowie and they'd be like who and I'd be like the person on your shirt and they'd be like I don't know and I'd be like okay I thought you were cool sorry and then I'd be like so what kind of music do you listen to and they're like we love this song stick to the status quo from high school musical which they would play over the camp loudspeakers like all the time and like as a standalone song like in the context of high school i don't know if you've seen high school musical no, you're I a haven't. better person for having not seen <laughs> high school musical but um in the context of the of the musical it's like the song where they explain the stakes of the world and like what what the the opposition is meant to look like in the overall right. structure as a standalone single it's literally just like stick to the status quo, only the stuff you know, you know, and like <laughs> right. these kids are like losing their shit, like it smells like Teen Spirit or something, and I'm just kind of like, oh my god, like they're s- they're wearing David Bowie shirts, but they don't know anything. You know? I know it's, it's, it's like terrifying. It's like living through a Hard Times article. <laughs> yeah, it's really it's it's quite disturbing actually. Oh, but well, we, I don't know. someone someone's got a uh, we got a David Bowie T-shirts should come with a david bowie album like yeah, he gets Ziggy stardust yeah, when he, it's 100%. just like uh you have to at least know uh one song yeah uh, I, I, some people say three i'll give you i'll just say one well, it's uh, fair. or or the name of the person <laughs> <laughs> it would be helpful it would be helpful yes my my hips my old man shouting at a cloud standards are very very minimal yeah um and and when did you get to new york so so i so you're in balt you're in baltimore uh, you're you're getting this local success. You're yeah. like you're 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 writing plays. The ba- the even so is is happening. How do you get to New York? Uh, so in a completely like circumventatious ass backwards sort of way. Um, uh, there, uh, there was a while where I was in Chicago for like a year, mm-hmm. uh, right in time for the economy to crash. Uh-huh. Uh, I was there in 2008. I was working like a you know, like a decent office job in Baltimore at a really like progressive publishing place. And it Mm -hmm. was like one of those like cool office jobs where like, sure you could 
wear band t-shirts and like they let you leave three hours a week to like go work out with a personal trainer because they were paying for your health care it was like Uh it's like the nicest office to this day that i've ever worked for Uh Uh, agora publishing in baltimore they're they're amazing people but around the same time i was like you know i'm not really progressing necessarily in my creative pursuits sure in the you know it's the the baltimore glass ceiling was kind of a thing and um so I decided to just quit and just spontaneously move to Chicago. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's a good thing I did because if I, I basically like watched all of my friends get fired over Facebook around this time because oh, wow. it was literally like, it was like a publishing agency that did financial newsletters. Uh-huh. And it's like when the financial crisis is happening and all you sell is like financial newsletters, like, yeah, you put all your eggs in the wrong basket. Yeah. Like it was really, so I'd literally just be like, good thing I followed my dream because well, fuck. Uh-huh. Um, and then, yeah, I was, I wound up in like a long distance relationship back in Baltimore and just wanted to go to grad school and other mm-hmm. stuff. And so I left Chicago after like a year, even though, you know, I really liked it there. Yeah. Um, and, um, had some, had some cool successes there also, but, um, then I wound up in Athens, Ohio for three years uh-huh. in a graduate pro- MFA playwriting program, which was s- great in a lot of ways, but like the last thing I expected to be spend sure. three years of my life. But, um, nice thing about Ohio is like you had to, you had to write a five page play every week and a full length play every year. And you're like, you know, teaching college classes and Uh everything else. And they pay you to be there, which is like amazing because I like just paid off my student loans before. And I was Mm -hmm. like, I'm not going to be fucking 30 and like a hundred thousand dollars in debt. Like that just seems like a surefire way to not continue being an artist. Um, and like, yeah, like it was, it was a cool time to be there and I got to focus and I wasn't super, I, I mean, my, the desperate part of me was like, NYU is the only place that matters. I need to be in NYU. Otherwise, I won't be a real artist. And yeah, I think I, I had that that kind of feeling, too. I definitely was like, well, I have to get to New York eventually. Because yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I, I think I always thought New York, because uh, mostly because of uh, big, bigger comedians I would see in Baltimore who I'd yeah. wor- work with and come through. Uh, Rory Scovel would... Uh, uh, I would ask, I would ask him about, Oh, how do you get to New York? It's like, well, you should, well, you should have some money and then you could get a temp job and then you could do yeah. like a bunch of sets at night. And I was like, Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. 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 Uh, so, um, so I, and, and so, and is Athens like an, I've no, I know nothing about Athens. It's a wild place. It's, um, we're the number one party school in all of America and about right. the number one most haunted campus in all of America. Ooh. Uh, cause there's an abandoned mental hospital that, somehow or another like the university acquired at some point like Mm -hmm. in the early aughts and it'd been closed since like the 70s and it was like one of those places where like there's like a fucking graveyard of unnamed patients back there because like they did Uh some shit and like the theater department had um prop storage there and i had to go there once for my graduate assistantship and i was just like you couldn't move in this place without seeing like a dismembered mannequin body part just like hanging out of a bin somewhere like oh my it was you there's like bad vibes in this place but mm-hmm. um that's where they that's where they sent the the mfa painting artists to have their studios of course which i was of like course. how can you hang in this place at night like it's fucking insane um but yeah it's uh i mean ohio is just a wild there's a lot of uh, for for nothing for a place that I can't think of too much regional specific things other than chili spaghetti and and the Cavaliers. Yeah, yeah. Um, although FC Cincinnati, uh, the soccer team, is very big in, yeah. in Ohio. I know that. Um, there's a lot of like really kind of different kind of pockets of of that state. So you go from there to new york to new york so yeah. you finish your grad program and you're like new york and city I'm like, for new york me. city i'm ready to do it uh-huh feel 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 ready now's the time let's go yeah and when did you get here 2012 2012, 2012. okay so a, f- uh, a couple years after me and then w- and then you get here and then um were you ever in a band in, here in new york or did you pretty much just hit I, playwriting right away yeah i was really trying i actually did sort of more po- podcasting more when I first got podcasting, here. You yeah, say. podcasting. Yeah, that is something I have interest in. Oh ho ho! <laughs> uh, yeah, I like. It was weird. There's a lot of 
Um, it's hard to be a playwright here uh, in a way that I didn't even realize. And it's taken me up and probably until like this point to even really like figure out how to make my own in there. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I, I mean, I was hyper burned out from grad school when I got here and I, but, mm -hmm. but I, but I was also like smart enough to be like all of that writing that you did over the last three years. Yeah. Like none of it is good enough for New York city. Yeah. So like get ready to jump back in there, dude, because yeah, nose to the grindstone. Like, gotta, gotta get fucking moving. Like, yeah. you know, and then, but I just didn't really, th a lot of the inroad, there's a lot of like, under 30s playwright residency deals mm -hmm. that'll like hook you up here but i was 30 and so you know, yeah i'm already off to pasture and so that was a non-starter and then you know like a lot of other places are just like ivy league alumni associations that you need to have three pulitzers to even get into you know like and it's yeah. it's just a weird and so like i turned to podcasting which at the time was like not what it is today it's right like, I'm trying to think in 2012. Yeah, because like there's very little avenues to like write a play, cast people, and then put it up somewhere. Yeah. That's really diff I feel like that's very difficult to do in, in New York. Not without and going like $10,000 into debt or something. Like yeah, ex exactly. Because, and, and then if there's nobody famous or you're not doing a jukebox musical yeah no, few, no yeah. fewer people are willing to take a risk on something oh completely like that just of, of not even money i think it's mostly just time with new yorkers oh 100 percent um so 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 you you turn to podcasting so yeah i'm thinking in 2012 i i know tech podcasts were big i know yeah. smod i know kevin and scott Mosier were doing smodcast yeah yeah i know wtf was starting to had just started to yeah. become really popular so you get in the podcasting and and what's your what's your plan? So I uh, zero plan really, but I, it's, it's, it's <laughs> the way once all again, great podcasts yeah, start. Completely ass backwards fall into it. Um, part of it was uh, I was living next door to a really good friend named Ryan Dowler, who um, uh, basically we did this thing called Dangerously Unqualified, where essentially he was my amateur dating coach, mm -hmm. and uh, the whole idea was it was going to be like hitch and he was going to like make me over to make uh -huh. me a more dateable human being and um i think i'm not actually sh sure about this but i think we were like the first serialized podcast where like there was a progression of plot right from episode to episode like serial i think came out maybe a year or so after we did it i'm not saying that they stole the idea or anything but um but uh but We're yeah listening like, sarah yeah we know <laughs> the other ira from baltimore um so yeah like it it was you know um but it was you know it was just like kind of a fun way to go i mean it's you can you can structure stuff but mm -hmm. leave room for spontaneity in a podcast format. Totally. And it's it's less about like, you know, being a playwright is just like sitting in a room for hours, like redrafting your fucking thoughts. And like, you know, the spontaneity of a podcast of just like we're, we're recording on this particular day. We mm -hmm. have to touch on these particular topics and prepare whatever. But for the most part, it's like a very free form yeah. medium. And it wound up, yeah. And I mean, people liked it. I mean, it wasn't, we were trying to get people to pay more attention to it, but mm -hmm. people were just like, what's a podcast, you know, sure, like, which sure. is still like now it's like everybody and their mother seems to have 10 podcasts, but like, oh, yeah. And there's podcasts about everything. There's like Dennis podcasts. Yeah. It's good. It's hilarious. We were, we were before our time, I think a little bit. And, uh, and so, and at some point I was, I started, um, a writing for this audio fiction podcast called the truth. Yes, I. This is something I picked up from your uh, Wikipedia page. I yeah. did not know oh, yeah. that you were, uh, you wrote for this show. It's my most high profile writing gig to date. I think probably. Uh, right uh, yeah, they're 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 a network show on the Radiotopia network. Very exciting. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it was cool. Uh, I mean, it was a lot different than playwriting because you know the process was a lot more like. Um, well, you're writing just for audio so yeah it's strictly for audio. a lot of focus on the words yeah but then but then also like the format of it was less scripted and more like you're kind of just generating ideas and then they have you know people from like the magnet theater like kind of riffing on those ideas mm -hmm. 
So it's you had in some ways like you had less like authorship, but it, it's it was probably a lot more akin to like movie writing or mm-hmm. like television writing, right? Where you start with an idea and it goes through a fil- few filters and changes. Yeah, and yeah, then, yeah. Um, which was which was yeah, it's like a neat a neat way to like throw yourself in there and kind of take the skills that you already have and use them in a really different light. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, you know, that kind of, both of those things kind of naturally came to a conclusion. Mm-hmm. Uh, like, um, and I think somewhere as shortly after that is when I got the mandolin and that was a big life changer. Yes. Yes. This is your like Excalibur. Moment. Yeah. Like literally like pretty much like, um, cause it, it's the way, you know, the da- the, the dating podcast was a lot of fun, but, um, at the same time it, it was difficult for me personally to like separate my actual personal self from like the, the person that was like the character on the show Mm -hmm. that I am also a co-creator and co-host of, Uh but as a result of the, uh, uh, you know, the, how we set the show up, I play this subordinate role where I'm like, the mule that they smack for comedy because I'm bad at dating or something. Sure. But, um, you know, the, and that's, and that's weird because it's that it's the, it's like the acne thing. It's again, it's like, everybody's like, you're the doofus. You know what I uh-huh. mean? And it's like, start putting you in that, that box. Yeah. They keep putting you in the box and it starts, it starts to get weird after a while because people think that that's authentically who you are when you're really like, this is a, a part of myself that I've chosen to show for purposes of this project but like right uh but like i'm more expansive than this uh and yeah then the mandolin showed up and uh, it just a lot of like the clouds lifted and i was like cool i get it and uh Mm -hmm. like i suddenly had a mythos which was something i always wanted like uh that was a neat thing to have a mythos that was cool um and i it was the first time i started using my middle name uh Mm -hmm. so i it's my name is ira gammerman but then i i perform music as ira lawrence which is yeah my middle name and also it's partly because like if you say ira gammerman people are just like how do you spell that and you know yeah goomermane you know i don't know but lawrence people get it there's yeah, no question a, yeah that's a, a quick one there's also a a, a, a recently deceased uh, attorney named ira gammerman oh i is he deceased i think he died recently Re- oh, oh, no, no he was a new york judge he was a judge he's a judge i have a funny story about that actually i uh <laughs> at some point i um i got arrested for smoking a joint on the street mm-hmm. and i the cops who were arresting me i like I was like, I'll get out of this. Like, and I'll be like, I'll be like, I was like, excuse me, police officers. Um, perhaps, you know, my grandfather, Ira Gammerman, mm-hmm. the New York Supreme Court justice, perhaps. And they're just like, nope, get in this wad car. And I was like, okay, cool. But the ironic thing was, is that when I was on trial, the lawyer was like, Gammerman, any relation to the judge? <laughs> and I was like, oh, yes, he's my grandfather. <laughs> um, so, the, so, <laughs> so the lawyer bought it, but uh-huh. the cops did not. Also, the cop arresting me was an EDM DJ, which was... Oh, well, that just... Uh, that should just disqualify any authority the badge gives A hundred percent. A hundred percent. I was getting fingerprinted, and I was just like... I've never been arrested before. Sure. And I... You know, like, it was like absurd. And I was just like... I was like... I was just like sh- shooting the shit. And I was like, you listen to Music Man? And he's like, oh, yeah, I'm an EDM DJ. And I'm like, does it bother you that like that music is like made by hard drugs for purposes of taking hard drugs too? And he's like, yeah. no, I don't mind. And I'm like... And I'm like, so let's say you're DJing a show and like you see somebody like snort a line of Molly like right in front of you. Do you like stop the show and arrest them? And he's like, no. And I'm like, why not? And he's like, look, man, you know, I'm only a cop Monday through Friday. The rest of the time I'm a DJ. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> however you want to live your life, I guess. Like, <laughs> it's fucking completely oh absurd. My God. <laughs> yeah, literally. Oh, God. There are, there are DJs and there are cop DJs out in New York. Oh, hell in a handbasket. Oh the CEO come. of Goldman Sachs is an easy DJ, if you can believe it. Um, I don't initially, but I su- it makes sense. Google it, people. I, Google it. Goldman Sachs 
CEO DJ. I swear it'll come up. It'll blow your mind. I, I will. I will. <laughs> um, uh, so you get the mandolin and then, because I saw you have like, what, three albums or like three EPs? Like, yeah. You're really prolific. I I really love um, Guided by Voices and John Darnielle. They're like, they were like my two kind of totems for that particular project of just like mm-hmm. lo-fi, quick and dirty, like, yeah, you know, like prolifically making shit and i've got one of those guys one of those focus right oh the focus right scarlet yeah these things amazing. oh these are amazing i've recorded like t- a bunch of songs on here just plugging uh not just doing the podcast but just plugging my guitar right in here plug my drum machine in here oh yeah it's re- it's really cool and it's like 140 bucks it's crazy yeah, yeah i've i've since upgraded to like the larger version of it but um for the most part yeah i the like my first album was like you, I think in my creative process, I just become aware sometimes of like, if you don't take the time to commit this to whatever form it needs to be committed to now, like there's, you're going to lose it. You know what I mean? Like if yeah. there's going to be, you're not going to be able to do it for like two years or something. Mm-hmm. And I wrote like my first like six or so songs, I think that were really good. And like had a friend who was like, I got a guy with a studio, I'll give you a day. You can lay down all six songs. And I was like, great. And um, it was my first time in a, in a recording studio since even so. And mm-hmm. um, I forgot the like, oh, yeah, when you're in a proper studio, like you only get like one take, maybe two takes. Yeah. And like you can't be as obsessive about it because you're like, this is time is money. Time is literally done. money. And I and I, and at some point I for my first album, I was writing tons of songs and I was like if i bring 10 songs into a for 15 or 20 songs or however many songs i've written into a recording studio they're gonna just look at me like a fucking ten thousand dollar whatever yeah. you know and i was like instead i could spend like less than a thousand dollars on like a an input and a couple of microphones and just mm-hmm. like do it myself and one christmas of like 2015 i was cat sitting and um like functionally semi homeless. And I was just like going from cat sitting gig to cat sitting gig. Sure. with like a duffel bag and my mandolin pretty much. And, uh, so my friends were away for, uh, for Christmas. And I literally had like two weeks alone in their apartment where I basically just like barricaded myself in there mm-hmm. and just recorded like what must've been like 15 or 20 songs over the course of that week. Like didn't speak to anybody. Like uh-huh. just was like alone in there. It was great. It was really it was like the Bonnie Vare uh, yeah. cabin, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, abs- uh, absolutely. Um, it was cool. It was cool. And then, you know, and then just because you have the freedom to just be able to record so quickly without having to, you know, book a studio or even necessarily write yeah. a song, uh-huh. you can sort of just record everything. And if something cool comes out... Yeah, you can just, like put it to to the other cool things later yeah Yeah, completely and so i just you know i just make music and do things mostly as just therapy and for my own mental well-being and eventually like if you do it enough like you have an archive of i mean god like for all the stuff i've actually released i'm probably sitting on like Mm -hmm. tons of things that i haven't even begun to figure out how to release yeah. Um, just because, you know, you just do it and you accumulate things like it's neat. Yeah. And, and being able to like, look back and like, have like, oh, I've created all these things that that's all t- that is very satisfying as well to have, uh, have something to show for all of the, w- all of the work, yeah. which I think is very exciting, which I think is very exciting and a very rewarding part of this. A hundred percent. Yeah. It was, that was one of the things about acting that was, was getting a little like frustrating for me at first, like just being like. I just bring my emotions to things and then they dissipate, you know, like, yeah. Um, it, it feels nice to be able to have like an oeuvre, you know what I mean? Like to do, just be like, Oh, that was my old record of the old times. Now I have a new record of the new times, you know, like there's something that it's, it's a neat way to mark time in a lot of ways. Absolutely. Um, is there something, this might be, uh, this is why I like to close on this sometimes. Oh, sure. Um, is there something you want to create that you haven't yet? Uh, I've been, I've been working on a big script for the last like three, four years that I'm right, like, this is the thing you were saying where it was ready for New York. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's going to be ready. Um, it's going to be ready very soon. I hope. Uh, but maybe now that, I, you know, I, I feel superstitious about saying these things, but, um, 
uh, yeah, it's taken a really long time and I'm like nearing the end of it. And it's honestly been so emotionally taxing that, you know, I don't know what happens from here, to be honest with you with it. Right. But like, it's one of these things where I'm like, if I don't get the desired reaction from this one, like I need to like step away from it and just sure. reconsider some things. Um, but, uh, and then after that, like, I just want to kind of be open to, you know, like new collaborations or if, if I'm going to be an actor again or something, or mm -hmm. like, if I'm going to be a TV writer, or I'm going to make another record or whatever I'm going to do. I just want to like be open. Cause the, the script is like taking a lot of, yeah, it's like personal focus that I've had to like, really like just be like, I'd like to do that. Mm -hmm. The other things and pursue them. But like, this is, this requires my attention and I need to devote myself to it, which Absolutely. has been, which has had drawbacks in a lot of ways, but sure. like, it's also been like the only way to get it done. And, you just got to do it sometimes. Oh yeah, absolutely. Just, just actually sitting down and, and doing the damn thing is yeah. as important as the, uh, the, that initial, the, that initial idea. And then like the discipline of like, uh, of, of, of letting it consume, you know, consuming, getting consumed by it and then giving, giving back to it. And then you have something that you can, that you're uh, excited about. And yeah, it sounds like sure. this is what that thing is for you. Um, yeah. I, I trust that it will, that it will be great because I've, I've known you to be a very creative, funny person I for a, a long I time. It. So, uh, um, I would be looking forward to seeing that, man. I'll, I'll keep you posted. I'll awesome. Keep you posted. And, and where can people find your stuff if they want to check, check your stuff uh, out? If you go to iralawrence.com, uh, or iralawrence.bandcamp, um, I also have a weird auto tune side project called, uh, Mr. Sunglasses. You go to Mr. Sunglasses.bandcamp. I, think <laughs> I, I, I missed that. So I'll have to check yeah, that it's, out. Uh, it's a whole different vibe. It's a whole different vibe, but, uh, yeah, it's mostly, it's mostly where I live on the internet. Right on, man. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Ira, for doing this. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having and, me. Uh, Tons of fun. Yeah. And I'll, I'll have to let you know when my band has a gig. Cause Please. We're, we're getting ready to play a gig soon. A hundred percent. Let me know. Awesome. Thank you so much, man. Yay. Okay, folks, that's our show for this week. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in. I appreciate it. It was great to get to chat with Ira, hear about the things he's got uh, going on, and uh, just to see that people that I went to school with uh, for creative things uh, are still doing those creative things. So uh, thank you guys again for checking this out. Uh, we're available everywhere you get your podcasts. If you want to tell a friend, I would greatly appreciate it. Uh, I also want to give a shout out to uh, my supporter on patreon at the awesome producer level uh mary beth thank you so much i really really appreciate you uh supporting me on uh patreon and if you guys want to check out some of the reward tiers i have available over uh on patreon.com slash awesome disaster uh there's a couple of different tiers and uh everything i create there i do not post anywhere else it is exclusively uh for folks who support me on uh patreon so thank you guys uh, again for checking that out and for listening to the show I appreciate you guys being here week after week and uh, I'm only getting more excited about this show as, uh, as I continue. So thank you guys again for being here and I will see you next week between awesome and disaster. Take care, everybody. <laughs>